Good to see you. Uh, okay, I have nothing at the top for you. Josh, what is on your mind? Thanks, Jen. Two questions. Uh, first, after the Rome meeting, since the war began, has China provided any military or economic aid to Russia or expressed any specific intentions to do so? I'm not in a position to confirm or detail any intelligence from here at this point in time. Okay. Moving on to the Russia-Ukraine talks, mm -hmm. what does the U.S. see that would be a sign for optimism that some kind of ceasefire could be reached? In which carrots, in which sticks do you think Putin is most responding to, if that's the case? Sure. Most likely to respond. Sure. Well, as you've heard us say in the past, uh, we certainly will continue to support uh, the Ukrainian participation in these talks and conversations, as long as they choose to continue to participate in them, of course. And we are trying to boost them by providing a range of not just economic and humanitarian assistance, but military assistance that we believe strengthens, strengthen, strengthens excuse me, their positions in these talks. Um, our view continues to be that despite words that are said in these talks or coming out of these talks, diplomacy requires uh, engaging in good faith to de-escalate. And what we're really looking for is uh, evidence of that. Uh, and we're not seeing any evidence at this point that uh, President Putin is doing anything to stop the onslaught or de-escalate. Uh, but that is really what we would be looking for. Go ahead. Thank you, Jen. And to follow up on the Rome meeting, what are the consequences for China if they do aid Russia? It's, well, I'm not going to get into specific consequences. I think what we have conveyed and what was conveyed by our national security advisor in this meeting is that should they provide military or other assistance uh, that, of course, violates sanctions or, uh, or supports the war effort, uh, that there will be uh, significant consequences. But in terms of what those specifics look like, we would coordinate with our partners and allies to make that determination. Okay. But Jake Sullivan certainly communicated that there would be consequences. Yes, as we have also said publicly a number of times. Okay, and then is there anything you can share about the president's potential meeting, um, potential trip to Europe in the next couple weeks, who he might be meeting with, and really what the point would be of uh, uh, going to Europe? Sure. Well, we are, of course, closely engaged with our NATO partners and European allies, as you've heard us say a number of times, uh, about the next steps in diplomacy, whether that's providing additional humanitarian or security assistance or the mechanics for future conversations. Uh, but there's not been any final decision about a trip, uh, so I don't have anything to preview about what that would look like if you were to take a trip. Thanks, Jen. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Uh, the president said back in February that the U.S. would respond forcefully if Americans were targeted in Ukraine. Uh, Brent Renaud was killed over the weekend. One of my colleagues was injured today. We're still waiting to hear if he's okay. So, what is that response going to look like? Well, let me first say, uh, your colleague Benjamin Hall, I know there's not final reports yet, or we would wait for your news organization to confirm those, but uh, our thoughts, the President's thoughts, our administration's thoughts are with him, his family, and all of you at Fox News as well. Uh, in terms of specific actions, I think you have uh, seen uh, the President uh, lead the world in taking, uh, putting in place consequence consequences, putting in place uh, repercussions and steps uh, in response to the actions of, of Russia, the brutal actions that have certainly impacted uh, Ukrainian people uh, and now have certainly impacted some Americans. But in terms of next steps or what the next consequence would be, I don't have anything to preview for you at this point in time. But we've seen the President been so far unwilling to draw a red line on the kinds of atrocities that we're going to watch from the sidelines. But we've seen maternity wards being bombed, uh, illegal weapons being used, pediatric hospitals being targeted. Um, President Obama drew the red line for Syria at chemical weapons. So is there any thought process about what we're willing to watch happen before Well, Jackie, I think it's important to reiterate as often as we can that what we're seeing is horrific, what we're seeing is barbaric. And the steps that the President has taken and led the world in taking have essentially led the Russian financial system to be on the brink of collapse. Uh, we have provided more military assistance to the Ukrainian military and the Ukrainian government than any other country in the world and more historic assistance than any other year to Ukraine in history. And we're doing that so that we can support them in this difficult moment. So 
I would say that uh, at this moment in time, we have been hardly on the sidelines. We have been leading this effort around the world to respond to every step and every escalatory step that President Putin and the Russians are taking. Isn't there a concern that if we don't draw the line at something like chemical weapons, that it'll make it easier for malign actors to use them in the future because they'll just go unpunished? Well, Jackie, I think that you heard the president say on Friday that there would be severe consequences and the world would respond if they were to use chemical weapons. And what we have been doing uh, over the course of the last several weeks, if not months, is providing as much information to the global community, to the media, and to others about what to expect. And when you have President Putin suggesting and Russian, uh, Russian officials suggesting that the United States and Ukrainians are the ones uh, who are working on a, a chemical weapons program, it's clear that that this is a pattern that we have seen in the past of them trying to set up a predicate for their own actions. But what does, what does that end up looking like if the world responds? Because so far we've heard the President talk a lot about what the U.S. is not going to do uh, in terms of, you know, not wanting to trigger a war with a nuclear power. Um, but do we believe that Putin is, you know, a rational kind of person who, you know, would, would pay attention to something like that? I mean, he didn't need provocation to, you know, invade Ukraine. Uh, why wouldn't we think that he would just create a pretext that is fabricated for something like that? We do. That's why we've talked about it. And I think, Jackie, what's important here is for any, and then I'm just going to move on to get to more people, is that for any president, you have to weigh how you can lead the world, how you can make very clear that actions are horrific, that they are not acceptable, they're not aligned with global norms, while also thinking about our own national security interests. And starting World War III is certainly not in our national security interests. Putting U.S. troops on the ground in Ukraine to fight a war with Russia is not in our national security interests. Go ahead. I just have to move on because I, otherwise I'm not going to get to enough people. Go ahead. Just you said, though, about, about misinformation in Twitter. Yeah. Um, because last year the president worked with Twitter specifically to address misinformation on vaccines, called it a wartime effort. Mm -hmm. uh, has there been any conversations with Twitter to address misinformation as it pertains to chemical attacks and that kind of thing, uh, given that the you know, Russia has banned this platform within the country, and they're using it to obviously target eyes outside of the country, including within the U.S., to spread propaganda. We are the ones who, who told you all about that. Uh, I agree. I don't have anything to read out for you in terms of private conversations with Twitter or any other social platform, but I'm happy to check and see if there's more. Go ahead. Back on the Rome talks, uh, have you seen any, or did you, your colleagues, see in this meeting any sign that China got the message that they are going to heed your warnings? Well, what we're going to be watching closely, of course, is actions. Uh, so beyond that, I think as my colleagues just uh, just uh, read out for you in a, in a call that we delayed the briefing slightly to make sure you could all participate in, it was an intense seven-hour session uh, reflecting the gravity of the moment. And it was an opportunity to be very clear about uh, what you've heard our national security advisor convey publicly, but more directly about uh, what the consequences would be. And you know, your colleagues have said, the, your deep concerns were conveyed about what would happen if China were to align more closely with Russia. Just big picture, if China does not heed the U.S.'s warnings, if they do move forward with this, how concerned are you that this is inching closer to the world war that the president has been warning of? Well, I think what we're looking at here, uh, one is if uh, China were to decide to be an economic provider or to take additional steps there to Russia, they only make up 15 percent or 20, 15 to 20 percent of the world's economy. The G7 countries make up more than 50 percent. So there are a range of tools at our disposal in coordination uh, with our European partners should we need to use them. But again, uh, we are uh, don't have anything to update you on in terms of an assessment. This is obviously an area we're watching closely. While this meeting has been planned for some time as a follow-up from the November call that pres the President had with President Xi, uh, it was a timely uh, and important moment. Uh, to have this conversation, especially given uh, the reports we've seen and uh, and the um, and the uh, invasion, of course, of Ukraine. Go, oh, go ahead. One more. Go ahead. One quick follow-up yeah. to, to Jackie's question sure. about, about chemical weapons. Um, you know, the president, as you noted, said on Friday that, that Russia would pay a severe price. What would that price look like? Are we talking in the realm of more sanctions? Can you give us sort of any big picture about what that would entail? That would be a conversation that we would have with our. Uh, partners around the world, but there's no question if Russia were to decide to use uh, chemical weapons, there would be a s severe reaction from the global community. Go ahead. Um, so when you talk about kind of the possibilities for China if they don't 
go along with what you've asked. Um, would you say, like you said with Russia, that everything is on the table, um, including ending trade negotiations, sanctions? Is that all on the table? I'm just not going to be in a position to detail it further from here. Uh, we'll see. We'll keep having this conversation over the coming days. But you won't do nothing if China decides to provide military We've been support. clear there would be consequences. That you, would, that you all would initiate. Yes. Okay. And then what's kind of your end game, thinking about what an end game looks like as far as um, these conversations with China? Do you want them to shift their strategic priorities and not have a, a relationship with Russia that it does now? Or are you looking for something more modest? It's uh, less about changing their mind and more about making clear with them what the consequences would be uh, should they take additional actions uh, to support uh, this invasion. Go ahead. And the additional $209 in security assistance yeah. the President signed off on this past weekend, an official said that part of it would go to anti-armor and anti-aircraft uh, systems, and the Pentagon says it's still kind of in process right now. Are these, are we talking about weapon systems that have already been delivered, or is there consideration of new types of weapon systems uh, in this tranche of funding? It's a good question, Phil. My understanding, and just to give you all uh, more detail, uh, this weekend, as I think you all saw, we announced, and I think that's why you're asking, uh, the President authorized an additional $200 million of security assistance, which utilizes the maximum amount of funding available to provide Ukrainians with the type of weapons they are using so effectively. It's really a continuity, as I understand it, let me double check this for you, of the type of weapons that they have been using very effectively on the ground to push back uh, on Russia, both in the air and on the ground. Um, so that includes, as you, as you noted, anti-armor, anti-tank, and air defense capabilities and ammunition of other types, and other types of assistance to address the armored, airborne, and other threats that they are facing. But my understanding, Phil, is it's a continuation of the types of security assistance that, um, that we have been providing. And of course, the President uh, is looking forward to, there's, there's a significant amount of funding, as I think you all have noted, in the omnibus uh, for Ukraine, which would enable us to provide even additional assistance uh, to, to add to that package. Okay. And then just a quick follow-up to one of Josh's questions. Uh, Deputy Secretary of State uh, this weekend said, quote, she's seeing some signs of willingness to have real serious negotiations. I think that differed a little bit from what we've heard from officials about the Russian posture up to this point. Can you elaborate on, on what the signs may have been, that may have been seen uh, in terms of giving the Deputy Secretary of State that view of things? Well, she also said that they would have to back any words with actions, essentially, uh, which I think is an important context, right? Uh, they did have talks today. Uh, there have been reports that they will have additional talks. Uh, we have been very appreciative of the efforts of our allies, France, Germany, Israel, and Turkey, uh, and others to be participants in these talks at times or engage in these talks at times. Uh, but again, diplomacy requires both sides engaging in good faith and to de-escalate. And uh, what we're really looking for is uh, specific delivery of actions. I think it's important to remember that there have been five or six attempts to implement a humanitarian corridor. Those have not been effective. Those have not worked. Uh, you've seen through video footage and others reports that those um, that has not been uh, abided by. Uh, so that is where we are keeping our eye and focus. Go ahead, Kelly. Do you get a sense that uh, as this conflict with Russia and Ukraine is happening, that other actors that are adversaries to the United States, China, uh, Iran, North Korea, are also testing the West uh, with uh, China's uh, work with Russia as your dealing with that, perhaps with Taiwan, uh, Iran with its rockets, North Korea also uh, showing its provocative nature. Is there a test of the West coming from some of the adversaries of the United States? Uh, we have not assessed those to be related, uh, as you have said. I mean, if you look at uh, the Iran, the missile strike uh, that we saw over the weekend. Um, no U.S. facilities were hit. No uh, personnel were harmed. Uh, we were not the targets of that. Uh, we have obviously seen tests and information we put out publicly as it relates to North Korea. We've seen dozens of tests over the course of past administrations as well. So uh, I would say we, we are not assessing it through those that prism. Has the administration reached out to American companies that have uh, property infrastructure in Russia to expect that to be nationalized by Russia and to lose those assets in Russia? We have been, uh, of course, engaged with U.S. companies, not encouraging them. Obviously, we've publicly applauding them, but they're going to make their own decisions as private sector companies. We've also conveyed, as we did publicly, I think, on Friday, that uh, there would be, uh, we, we would certainly look to consequences should that happen. 
Go ahead. Uh, the former White House COVID advisor, Andy Slavitt, has a Twitter thread today in which he talks about the potential for a, an increase in COVID cases this spring. He says, based on European case increases, the U.S. could see a new rise in COVID cases. Uh, are you confident the administration has the uh, real-time data it needs to provide the best information possible to the public? To, uh, to assess data? Yes. Uh, yes, we are. I would note that I, I, I did not see his, tread, his thread, but let me know, and I'm not sure if it was related to the BA2 variant. Was it related to the BA2 variant? Okay. Um, what we do know about the BA2 variant, which I think is important context for people, is that it's circulated in the United States for some time. Uh, we've been watching it closely, of course. Uh, we currently have about 35,000 cases in this country. We expect some fluctuation, especially at this relatively low level, and certainly that to increase. Um, I would also note that um, while BA2 is, more transmissible, is a more transmissible version of Omicron, uh, the tools we have, uh, including mRNA vaccines, therapeutics, and tests, are all effective tools against the virus. And we know because it's been uh, in the country. And so as we're watching, and I think a lot of the reporting has been uh, about, of course, the UK, but also China, and China has a zero tolerance policy, as you all know, but they also did not conduct their vaccination and booster campaigns with mRNA vaccines. So that is important context too, as you're seeing the impact. What I would note, just to go back to your earlier part of your question, is that we are still pressing the place where, where it is concerning is the fact that we need additional COVID funding. Um, and we have talked about this. We talked about this a little bit in the past, but uh, last week, all running together, but, um, but without COVID response resources and additional money, there could be immediate impacts on testing capacity. Uh, the uninsured fund, which offers coverage of testing and treatments for tens of millions of Americans who lack health insurance, and an on our supply of monoclonal antibodies. And that means that some programs, if we don't get funding, could abruptly end or need to be pared back. And that could impact uh, how we are able to respond to any variant, of course. I do just want to ask you one more quick yeah. question. We, we noticed the President, when he came on stage today at the Marriott, had a mask on. Is that something he's been advised to do, or is that something he just feels more comfortable doing? It, often he does that when it's required by a specific event, as he did when he went to Texas last week. I can certainly check on that. He was tested yesterday and tested negative. Uh, go ahead. Um, thanks, Jen. Uh, so on Ukraine, the president has made clear that he sort of has a red line with Russia in terms of not wanting to do anything that would get into a direct confrontation or lead to World War III, as he puts it. I'm curious, and you're not sharing specifics, but in broad strokes, does he have a similar red line um, now with China assisting Russia? And are, is the, does he not want to get into a direct confrontation with China? And are there certain things he's not willing to do because of that? Let me see if I can answer your question, but tell me if I'm not. Um, we don't like red lines around here, so I'm not going to use that phrasing. But um, you are obviously correct that what he is, he's been very clear and consistent about his, uh, that he does not have the intention of sending U.S. troops to Ukraine. Uh, that has not changed. Uh, I would look at, well, we are certainly watching closely uh, the actions of China. Whether uh, whether that is support of any kind, uh, in support of any kind uh, for Russia, and certainly there would be consequences to that. Uh, I do think we look at it through a slightly different prism. I mean, Russia is invading Ukraine uh, actively, so I'm not. But I'm not sure if I'm answering your question or not. Sort of, just to follow up. I mean, you, right? No ground troops in Ukraine, but also there have been other things, such as not enforcing a no-fly zone or not providing um, the fighter jets yeah. that the president has been reluctant to do. Um, so again, you said you're not sure in specifics. You said uh, Jake Sullivan said significant consequences for the Chinese. But I'm wondering if there are certain things that you will not consider because it could lead to a direct confrontation with China that you're reluctant to get into, the same way you are with Russia. I just think we look at it slightly differently. I mean, what I'm talking, what we, why the president has been so clear about not sending U.S. troops is obviously because that would be a military conflict. Um, we're not fighting, obviously, in a, there's no military conflict at this moment with China, uh, nor do we, nor are we predicting that. Um, so I, I think we just, it's slightly different. And one just, uh, sure. Different topic. Um, how high uh, is the administration expecting gas prices to go? Um, and, and how much, is there a limit, not a red line, but a limit at what you think the, the U.S. <laughs> public can bear? This just flows off the tongue. It's okay. Um, uh, so it's a good question. We don't have, I don't have a prediction from here in terms of what it could look like. There are outside predictors, of course, and obviously what we're trying to do is mitigate the impact. Um, you know, and you've seen, of course, um, you know, the, the price of oil go down.
down a little bit, um, and the president will continue to look at a range of steps that he can take, whether it is engaging uh, through his team or through even himself personally with uh, big global producers, uh, or it is looking at a range of domestic options. Um, but we've seen it go up. I mean, we look at a lot of the same data you look at, AAA and other data, uh, that it shows us how much uh, it has gone up since the period of time when uh, Russian troops lined up on the border. But in terms of how far, uh, we, you know, we still believe it will continue to go up, but we're trying to take steps we can take to mitigate that and reduce it. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you. Um, I understand you don't want to lay out what the severe consequences would be uh, if Russia used chemical weapons, but I guess what I'm confused about is we know there's not going to be any U.S. troops, no jets, no no-fly zone. Other than the things you've already done, which you have already described as severe, could you give us some examples of what more you can do since you've ruled out all these things. Just when you talk about severe consequences, what does that mean, given that it, we know what it doesn't mean? Sure. I, yeah. I understand your question. I'm just not going to outline that from here. Those are conversations that will happen, continue to happen with our national security team and with our partners and allies around the world. What you're, you're asking us to believe is that there are severe consequences that you haven't used yet, but that are not on the no list. Correct. Okay. But you won't tell us what kinds of things those might be. Uh, we're going to have those conversations privately through our national security team and with our partners around the world. Okay, but, but do you, I guess what I'm wondering, what about the argument that there just aren't any more severe consequences for you to use because most of the severe ones you've ruled out? That's inaccurate. Uh, go ahead. Um, just on the Fed nomination. Yeah, sure. um, nice try, does, the White have, does the White House have any assurances from any Republican senators that they would support Sarah Bloom Raskin's nomination? And did Senator Manchin give the president or anyone in the administration a heads up about his opposition to her, no to his, to her nomination? I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if that was a surprise. Sure. I understand your question. Uh, we were aware of his position in advance of, his, of Senator Manchin's announcement. Uh, we are, um, uh, she is one of the most qualified not individuals to ever be nominated to this position. And so where we are now is our focus is on continuing to work with Chairman, uh, Chairman Brown to garner bipartisan support. But I don't have anything to read out for you on that front at this point. How did Senator Manchin make you aware that of his opposition? Was there a call to someone in the White House? Did the President know? What did that look like today? I'm just not going to detail more specifics. One last question, if yeah. you don't mind. How is the administration preparing to respond to the potential supply chain shock, excuse me, posed by China's decision to lock down the tech production hub in uh, Shenzhen? So we are, of course, monitoring this incredibly closely, um, and our team is uh, quite focused on it. Uh, what I will say is that because of the steps we've taken and a number of um, steps we've taken to better uh, better prepare and strengthen the supply chain. Um, you know, we, we feel that uh, that has helped us, uh, will help us sustain. Um, but in terms of, we're, right now we're basically in the stage where we're monitoring with the State Department. What we're looking at is, of course, as you know, the, the impact on some of these ports um, around uh, where the impacted areas of China. Um, and we know here that, of course, our port action plan and the work of our supply chain disruptions task force, uh, that we have a strong inventory that we can rely on. It's about 90 percent of goods at groceries and drug stores are in stock currently. And we've also reduced the number of import containers sitting at the docks for over nine days by over 60 percent. But in terms of specific impacts of ports in China, we're, we're monitoring it and we don't have a new assessment at this, an addition, uh, up-to-date assessment, I should say, at this point in time. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Um, is it the U.S. assessment, just to be clear, that Russia is deliberately targeting civilians in Ukraine? Well, this is part of our assessment and review as we're looking at how we're, uh, whether we will designate as a war crime. Uh, and we look at this through uh, a legal process internally, obviously the targeting of civilians. Uh, and we have seen uh, a, a range of very concerning video reports, other, uh, would, would be categorized in that, uh, through that, as in that phrasing. Uh, but we have a process that we're still working through here. Last week at a briefing, you told us that us as reporters should, quote, not focus a lot of our conversations about the future of the United States importing oil at this point from Venezuela. Mm -hmm. were, you, were you ruling out that the U.S. would import oil? I'm just saying it's not an active conversation at this time. Hi, thanks. Um, does the White House have any reaction to Jenny Thomas acknowledging that she attended the January 6th rally? I do not. And just kind of on that, does her attendance there raise any kind of concerns about the independence of the Supreme Court 
potential conflicts of interest or anything like that. I just don't have any more comment on it at this point in time. Go ahead. Hi, Jen. For the second time in two weeks, a group of hundreds of Haitian migrants has landed by boat in the Florida Keys. Uh, given the surge we saw last year in Del Rio of Haitian migration, uh, what is the administration's reaction to these landings? Are there any plans to send any assistance either to Haiti or Florida? I'm sure we can get you a update on uh, the humanitarian assistance we provide directly to Haiti. We are the largest, if not one of the largest, providers of humanitarian assistance in the world. Uh, in terms of the individuals arriving, uh, I think in Florida, as you said, I, I would really point, point you to the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we are still applying Title 42, and so that applies no matter which country you're coming from. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, yeah, the President of Colombia said last week that he had offered President Biden the possibility of supplying more Colombian oil to the U.S. as an alternative to Venezuelan oil. Is that an option that the White House is considering? We are continuing to talk to a range of producers on the importance of maintaining global supply. Uh, this is not, as you know, about just the supply in the U.S., but about ensuring their supply for the global market. And we do appreciate our partnership with Colombia. Uh, and President Biden uh, did discuss a range of issues like economic recovery, energy security during their conversation. Uh, but beyond that, I don't have an update on what that might look like. Would you say that is under active consideration? As Again, they had a they had a wide ranging conversation, a very constructive conversation. Uh, this is really about supply in the global markets, but I don't have an update at this point in time. Yeah, as a follow up, uh, Chevron is preparing to um, take operating control of its joint ventures in Venezuela. Reuters just reported that in case the U.S. would grant them special license to operate, is that something that's on the table? Um, I think I just answered it a few minutes ago. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks, Jen. Uh, you said earlier in, in the press briefing that nothing has been decided about President Biden uh, traveling to Europe. Can you confirm uh, that such a trip uh, is under consideration? We discuss a range of ways and mechanics for engaging with our friends and partners around the world. But I don't have any more specifics for you at this okay. point in time. And this morning, Leader Schumer and Speaker Pelosi announced that Zelensky, uh, President Zelensky of yeah. Ukraine uh, will be delivering an address to the full House and Senate on Wednesday morning. Uh, what's the White House reaction uh, to this address? Are there any concerns uh, that the White House has about the Ukrainian president uh, uh, speaking directly with, the, with Congress as opposed to uh, the White House on its various positions and requests? We speak frequently with President Zelensky. The President spoke with him, had a lengthy conversation with him directly on Friday, and we're in touch with uh, Ukrainian government officials nearly every day, if not every day. Uh, we certainly support uh, leaders in Congress inviting him to address a joint session. And I would again reiterate that there's strong bipartisan support for Ukraine, for the leadership and the bravery of President Zelensky, and we'll all look forward to watching his speech on Wednesday. And then finally, on Sarah Bloom Raskin and uh, Senator Manchin's uh, announcement that he doesn't support her confirmation, does the White House still see a path uh, to getting her confirmed in the evenly divided Senate? We are uh, going to continue our work with Chairman Brown to garner bipartisan support. But again, she is one of the most qualified individuals ever to be nominated to this position. So but that's where our focus is. Her forward still and believe yes. that you can get her confirmed? Yes. Okay. That is where our focus is. We wouldn't be pushing for bipartisan support if she wasn't still our nominee. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Um, two questions on uh, WNBA star Brittany Greiner. Last week you had said you couldn't comment on the case. Is there any update you can give now on the efforts the administration may be taking to secure her release? We do not have a Privacy Act waiver. Um, and does the White House have any reason to believe that Reiner is being used as a political pawn by the Russian government, or does the administration see this strictly as part of the Russian criminal justice system? We just can't speak any more to the reports of this case. Go ahead. Thank you very much, oh, Jen. We'll come back to you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, on a possible trip to Europe, uh, is President Biden considering visiting maybe perhaps the Ukrainian border and visit refugees, Ukrainian refugees, like for other foreign leaders are doing? Is this something you would like to do? I just don't have anything more on the reports. Um, again, um, we uh, have a range of conversations with our NATO partners and European allies about the next steps in diplomacy, but I don't have anything to confirm for you in terms of the report. And just one yeah. more. Um, uh, not just China, but some of the biggest countries in the world, like India or Brazil, some countries in Latin America, like Mexico, they are not uh, part of this economic war warfare against Russia. Is this something that uh, undermine 
the effort from uh, these White House and European countries? I would say it doesn't undermine our efforts. Uh, we have been working to build a global coalition far beyond the G7 uh, and our NATO partners and had a great deal of success in that. And every country has to decide where they want to stand, uh, where they want to be uh, as we look and the history books are written. Go ahead. I think we've got to move just on. Quickly, we just to get around. Do you okay. just believe this economic um, pressure will stop Vladimir Putin um, from uh, his invasion? Well, I think as we've seen, the impact of the president's leadership on the global stage and the uh, economic consequences that have been put into place have uh, led Russia and the Russian economy to be on the brink of collapse. Uh, and uh, there's no question that uh, over time uh, that will have an impact. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, furthering that point, um, you did mention at the top of this briefing that there has been no action on the part of Putin to, to stop the onslaught. You haven't seen any action. Mm -hmm. um, and that is after, again, all of these you know, severe economic sanctions have been levied. And so, you know, I'm wondering why the administration thinks that this threat of, of further severe action that is vague, that is unnamed, will deter him from using chemical weapons? Well, I think um, the reason that we spoke out last week about uh, chemical weapons is because we felt that it was important for the global community to understand that they had the capacity, the capabilities, and that they have used them in the past. And at the same time, they were accusing inaccurately, they were spreading false information about the U.S. and the Ukrainians' intentions. That was the origin of why we were so outspoken last week. So uh, this is more about us making clear to the world what we've seen as patterns uh, in the past and what their capabilities and capacities are. Go ahead. Thank you, Jen. Um, President Biden has repeatedly said no U.S. troops inside Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, are there any U.S. troops still training Ukrainians outside Ukraine? And if not, could that be a thing as as we move forward? This you mean in neighboring countries? Yeah, like bases outside Ukraine. And if it becomes a long-term conflict, as obviously many predict, mm -hmm. could that be a thing the United States does? Let, let me check with the Department of Defense. We obviously had trainers on the ground for a period of time. We hadn't. Then we pulled uh, them back. We obviously have a significant military presence uh, in a range of countries in the region. Uh, but I can see if there's anything. Uh, that we are looking that ahead to. Be considered an escalatory type of thing, you know, a bit like the MIGs, which got complicated because no one knew kind of how to get them to the Ukrainians. Like if you had Ukrainian soldiers going into Poland, sure. trained by U.S. troops to go back and fight Russians. I mean, I think really our focus right now is on providing them and continuing to expedite the military assistance to them. And the good news is that we still, through our coordination with them and our NATO allies, were able to get them that assistance on the ground. They are actively fighting now, so that's where our focus really is at this point in time. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, on the Federal Reserve, would um, the administration that supported the four nominees who seem to have the votes to be uh, confirmed to go forward and deal with the Raskin nominee after? Well, there's enough support to move all five nominees through the committee. So we think the Republicans should show up so that they can vote them through the committee. And on uh, one last thing, the fact that China is in the conversation about helping Russia, um, should U.S. companies then look at maybe decoupling from China with their investments there and, and be cautious? What's the message uh, that you have? Can, can you trust the Chinese? I don't think it's about trust, um, but we have not made an ask or, or a request at this point of that. Go ahead. Jen, Jen thank you. Uh, at the Democratic retreat in Philadelphia mm -hmm. last week, uh, some of my colleagues were hearing a lot from Democratic lawmakers who want uh, the president to do more by executive action, whether it's on immigration or whether it is on uh, some of the, the other priorities of the administration. Did he have any conversations with the members there about possible further executive actions? And is there anything else uh, that you're hearing from the members and those meetings with the Black Caucus and other members of Congress in the last week or two that, that may uh, be coming forward? Well, I would say all of these members uh, can speak for themselves on what they're interested in and what they're requesting from uh, the president and from this administration. Uh, we, we have a range of uh, executive authorities. Uh, the president does, I should say, has a range of exec executive authorities. I think there have been some reports about some that are under consideration, including one on policing, which we have talked about a bit in the past. So sure, we still continue to consider what steps we can take through executive actions, even as we work with Congress to see what we can move through there as well. And I think there's no update beyond the legal review continuing on the student loan 
question. I don't have an update at this point in time, no. Go ahead in the back. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, and then I'll go to your friend Thank next you very to you. Much. On North Korea, it is reported that North Korea's ICBM launch is imminent. Do you have anything on the North Korea's imminent launch of ICBM? I, I don't have anything on that uh, report. I've not seen that report. What I can tell you is that. Um, you know, as you know, uh, last week we uh, proactively decided to reveal information publicly about uh, recent tests and share it with allies and partners, as well as Congress. Uh, we have seen North Korea escalate its testing in different periods over the last four presidents, and this time North Korea hid these tests unlike the fanfare over past tests. But I don't have anything to predict in terms of the future. I said I'd go to go ahead. Um, Japan and some of the other treaty countries are increasingly alarmed after Afghanistan and this recent situation. Could you let the uh, Japanese uh, government know that the security treaty will be honored? And then second, um, for those of us that were embedded during the war, the whole situation with Af Afghanistan is quite personal. There's a large number of our people that helped us that are still left. Could you just update us on, on almost six months whether they'll be able to come back? Well, I would say on the second part um, that that is one of the reasons that we've worked so closely with our cuttery, uh, with the cutteries, uh, to maintain a diplomatic presence there, so that we continue to engage with neighboring countries to bring people home and help uh, some of our partners and allies who stood by our side, fought by our side over the course of the 20-year war. That's ongoing. In terms of the the numbers, I would point you to the State Department, who would have the most up-to-date numbers. I'm not sure I understand your first question. Just a reassurance to Japan and a lot of the countries that have treaties with us that are worried, you know, if, if a situation like this develops, if those treaties are going to be honored. Which situation? How would it relate to Japan? Af Afghanistan is a long partners of ours. And so, you know, be, the whole situation that's happening now, Taiwan, there's a great concern that if you have a treaty and it comes to a difficult situation, whether it's really going to be honored. We've never stepped back from the, the commitments we've made under the Taiwan Relations Act, and uh, the President stands by those. Go ahead, James. Thank you very much, Jen. Uh, two questions on Russia-Ukraine. Prior to February 24, the President, uh, our NATO allies, and the EU were embarked on a deterrence project. That's exactly the word that you and other senior U.S. officials used at the time. Quite clearly, the invasion was launched on the 24th of February, and so we can say as a factual matter that that deterrence project failed. Is it the view of the White House that Mr. Putin could not be deterred by any set of steps, or are you willing to concede that perhaps some other set of steps by the President and our allies might have deterred the invasion? Uh, you know, James, I would say that when we put in place the threat of sanctions and the threat of consequences, uh, we never thought that that would be uh, fail-proof uh, or that would be 100 percent effective. We did that because we wanted to lay out the clear consequences should President Putin proceed in invading Ukraine, even as we predicted quite consistently that that was very much his intention. And what we have done since that point in time is implement those sanctions and implement those consequences far beyond what I think and most people's expectations were in the world about what those would look like. I don't think it's I don't think I can look in a rearview mirror or any of us can and predict what would have been different. What we did is we took steps to rally the world uh, to stand up to the aggressions of President Putin, and we have implemented them and followed up on what we committed to since that point in time. One key decision made by the President early on was to remove strategic ambiguity from this equation. Never really was Mr. Putin forced to wonder what consequences he would face. He was told at the outset he would never face military intervention by the United States and NATO, uh, that the, the full range of the punishments he would face would amount to diplomatic and economic sanctions. Um, I think a lot of people wonder why um, a greater effort wasn't made to, to leave Mr. Putin in doubt about the consequences he might face. Because the President is the President of the United States of America, and he felt it was important to be uh, clear with the American people about what his intentions were and what they were not. And his intentions were not to send uh, men and women, their sons and daughters, to fight a war in Ukraine against Russia. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Iran. Okay, I'll do both. Go ahead. Ladies first. Thank you. Know? you. Okay, go ahead. Uh, on Iran, the Iran talk security was stalled amid some last-minute demands by Russia. 
Um, are the Iran talks dead? And if not, what now? <clears throat> Well, right now, um, the negotiators are back home in their capitals. Uh, we'll see what happens in the days ahead with diplomacy around the deal. Uh, we continue to believe that, um, you know, obviously a diplomatic path forward is the best path forward, but this is a natural part of the process. It is also uh, standard for the most difficult parts of the conversation negotiations to be happening at the end. And then just on Ukraine, uh, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa says he's been asked to mediate between Russia and Ukraine. Would the White House support that, endorse that, um, in any way assist with that, especially since the African model kind of tends towards like restorative justice, truth and reconciliation instead of, you know, traditional justice? I'm happy to check with our national security team on his role. What I can tell you is that there have been a half a dozen global leaders who have been meeting with both the Russians and the Ukrainians and engaging, of course, directly uh, through diplomatic channels and trying to uh, come to a, uh, a diplomatic conclusion here. We have been engaged directly with them on the front end and back end of those conversations and encourage them to also make sure they are uh, engaging with the Ukrainians and not just the Russians. But I will check if there's uh, any specific. This I'm happy to check specifically, but again, there's a range of countries that are already uh, playing this role. So uh, go ahead. In the, go ahead. With the COVID, funds, thank you, by the way. Sure. Uh, with COVID funds falling off the omnibus, yeah. and it may take a bit. You know, Congress kind of uh, bank for that to get done. Has the White House ask changed at all? Are they come back to you know lawmakers and said, hey, well, it's going to take a while. You know, we need more, or it's a different place. I'm just curious how that. You mean in terms of asking for less money or something like that, or you know, I or more money? Is, what is the timing? Yeah. And does the timing change the needs of the White House? Well, the the time. I mean, we're we're asking for money to meet exactly the needs that are going to start to uh, to come up soon in the coming in the coming weeks, even, and in supporting a number of the programs that have been pivotal to people across this country, especially people who are uninsured, people who are relying on access to free treatments, testing. Uh, vaccines. Uh, obviously, these are programs that it's not only in the United, in the U.S. government's interest to continue, but it's in the interest of the American people, especially people who don't have the resources to cover and pay for a lot of these different uh, treatments. Uh, we had originally we had requested uh, 22.5 billion dollars. I think you're aware for immediate and urgent COVID response needs because that is the funding we felt uh, we needed. That does not mean it would cover uh, the needs in forever. That would just be the needs uh, we have at this moment in time. So these conversations are still ongoing with, uh, with leaders in Congress. Uh, we, we are, uh, but we want to be very clear about the fact that uh, some of these programs could abruptly end and be pared back uh, without additional funding. Uh, uh, just, uh, you, you mentioned the uninsured for the HRSA program that reimburses for uninsured funds. You guys previously said it would end this month. Is that timeline still there? I mean, is that, that you mean if we don't have funding? Until the end of the month, they shut that down? Uh, I, a lot of these programs could end quite abruptly, so uh, it could, uh, but I will check and see if that specific one would. Go ahead. Um, Title 42, two related questions. Yeah. One of them, Democratic senators and Congress people and activists are criticizing the president. During the campaign, he said that this Trump era policy was inhumane, yet he's keeping it, even though the country's opening again. But then a few days back, the CDC decided to let unaccompanied minors in. So the fear is that this is going to make a lot of parents just send their children by themselves and lead to another humanitarian tragedy at the border. Well, I would say first, um, I mean, as you've noted, um, the CDC makes determinations about Title 42. Um, I think um, as it relates to the recent decision, I'd have to talk to the Department of Homeland Security specifically about that and how they're applying it or implementing it. As you know, our intention is certainly not to put more children at dan in danger uh, or put them uh, uh, incentivize uh, parents sending kids uh, on a journey that's treacherous and dangerous um, across the border. Uh, but the president, uh, you know, he is implementing this because we are still in the middle of a public health uh, crisis. Uh, that continues to be the case, as designed by the CDC. He still plans to reopen the border and make a more humane policy like he promised? Uh, that, is, that is what he proposed on his first day in office, and we were very supportive of the efforts in the Senate to do exactly that. And just because it's not done yet, it doesn't mean uh, that we aren't going to stay at the fight to get exactly that accomplished and done. Is, is there any reason why you've not condemned racism against Africans in Ukraine? I understand that Ukrainians are the victims here. They are being bombed by Russia, and they are being killed. But a lot of Africans there are facing racism. 
tourism. I know you are providing a lot of uh, financial assistance to Poland and to Ukraine, but Africans there have been bar, uh, from even entering Poland. Why have you not officially, the White House, issued a statement condemning racism against Africans? We, we, we have, and I believe the State Bar Department has, but we have uh, spoken uh, out against that and expressed concern about any reports of discrimination or uh, at the border. And finally, if I may ask you, I, I'm trying to understand what you are trying, your end game in Ukraine. You, you are not going there, you are not sending troops there, there, there will be no flight, no, no flight zone over Ukraine. And are you, will it be a fair assessment to say that you are pushing these guys to commit suicide, knowing that Russia has a superpower and eventually it will uh, capture the main cities, Kiev and Kharkiv and all the cities around there? What's the end game? Well, the end game is really a question for President Putin. We have, we have completely crushed his economy. Uh, we have provided military assistance, humanitarian assistance to the Ukrainians, enabling them to fight back for far longer uh, than the Russian leadership uh, anticipated. Uh, and again, he has, to, uh, he has to determine what the path forward looks for, like for him. Thanks, everyone. Can you confirm the rumors that the Russian hit squads keep going after journalists? Uh, I don't have any details on that for you. Have you heard there's more? Thank you.